Good evening and welcome once again to our midweek Bible study, our virtual lift class. If this is the first time you've been with us, welcome. So glad to have you on board tonight. And if you have watched before, well, we're so glad to have you back again. How are you doing with the coronavirus? Are you getting a little bit stressed? Has it been about enough of a good thing, or maybe not such a good thing? Uh, you know, I hope you're not lonely, because did you know that loneliness is as bad as smoking when it comes to your health? People who are lonely get sick more often, and they're all more subject to depression. So I hope you're not lonely. In Psalm set, chapter 68, verse 6, the Bible says, And God puts the lonely into families. Well, if you don't have a, a family, uh, I hope that you're a part of a church family. And you say, well, what can I do? I'm kind of corralled here. I'm in my home in isolation. Well, why don't you contact somebody else? Give somebody a call or text somebody and let them know that you're thinking of them. Because it's not good for us to dwell together in isolation. Uh, on Monday, Pat and I had to go to the Canadian Tire because our uh, microwave came up dead. Um, and you know, we just can't exist, can't live without a microwave. And we noticed that even though we were paced six feet apart to get into the store, uh, people seem to be returning somewhat to normal. And uh, BC is going to get back to kind of a new normal again soon. Well, our study is in the book of Acts, and this evening we're looking at Acts chapter 5. Now, I'm actually going to give you some background from Acts chapter 4. In the first four books of the New Testament, the four Gospels, we have the story of Jesus, his ministry and his activities, what he shared with the people, and ultimately, of course, his death and resurrection. But in the fifth book of the New Testament, the book of Acts, we have the history of of the early church. So I'd like to read Acts chapter 5 verses 1 to 11. Now there was a man named Ananias who together with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and with his wife's full knowledge he kept back a part of the money for himself but he brought the rest and he put it at the apostles feet. And then Peter said to him, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept part back for yourself. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? Who made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but you have lied to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then the young men came and forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came to the second service, I guess, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for your land? Yes, she said, that is the price. And Peter said to her, how could you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of the men who buried your husband are already at the door, and they will carry you out also. And at that very moment she fell down at his feet and died. And then the young men came, and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. If you don't have a Bible handy, I would suggest that you get one and Open it up to the book of Acts because it'll be more meaningful if you can follow along in your own Bible. Also, if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, you can do so on the chat line just beside the picture there in your frame. Uh, if you would like prayer, our church office is open from 8.30 in the morning till 4.30 in the afternoon every weekday, and we would be more than happy to say a prayer for you and with you. Well, in Acts chapter 4, we visited two different venues. First of all, we visited a courtroom, 
where the apostles were put on trial before the Sanhedrin, which was what the civil court of Jerusalem. And then we visited a prayer room. And the Bible says that when they prayed, the whole building shook. We need some soul-shaking prayer these days. I don't know if you recall, but there's certain events that kind of bring a world shaking into focus. For example, I remember where I was when I heard that JFK, John Kennedy, had been assassinated. I also remember hearing in the 11 o'clock news at night, the commentator came on and his first words were, Lady Diana is dead. I remember that vividly. I remember when our daughter, Cherie, phoned us. We were pastoring in Nanaimo at the time. And uh, she said, are you watching the news? And I said, Cherie, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. Who watches the news at 8 o'clock in the morning? She said, well, the United States is under attack. And I said, no, Cherie, you must be misunderstanding something. The United States couldn't be under attack. But when I turned on the TV there, of course, the Twin Towers were indeed being attacked. We remember those moments as almost earth-shaking. And today we have the COVID-19 crisis. And I think there's been a shaking in the Maritimes with this recent shooting. But uh, we need the prayer that brings a shaking to our world and to our souls. And uh, I'm going to share with you this evening that the early church was a praying church. It was one of the secrets of their success. Now, it's a little easy for us to overstate the emphasis, the power and the miracles that occurred in the early church. We need to remember that uh, this actually is a history record that covered a period of about 30 years. Now that means that miracles were probably not piled on top of each other every day. But when we read this account, we do find that the church was filled with authority and power and they did perform many miracles. Let me just read you a couple of examples. In Acts chapter 2, verse 43, it says, Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miracle, miraculous signs were done by the apostles. In Acts chapter 4, verse 33, it says, And with great power the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. In chapter 5, our text, verse 12, it says, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. Acts chapter 5, verse 16, again, many miracles. There is no denying that God's presence and God's power was with that early church. A later account says they turned their world upside down. Now, last week I shared with you some of the characteristics of that early church. Let me just review those quickly. They were absolutely convinced that Jesus had risen from the dead and that he was at the right hand of his heavenly father and that he had given them a power and authority. They were convinced that Jesus was indeed with them, working in them and through them. They were also filled with the Holy Spirit. They believed that Acts chapter 1 verse 8 was actually true. It says you will receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And they believe that that Holy Spirit power was present in their lives and in their ministry. They also believe that they were a part of God's great eternal plan, that their lives had a purpose and a meaning. There was a reason for them not only to live, but also to serve the Lord. And finally, they were living in total obedience. We're gonna see that, how important that is again this evening. But let me just give reference to one verse in Acts chapter 5, verse 33, where it says, uh, verse 32 rather, We are witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. If you desire a greater sense of God's presence, a stronger infilling of the Holy Spirit in your life, then this is one of the keys. Walk in obedience to him.
Tonight I want to give you a few more traits of that early church, and they are recorded for us in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, and then again in Acts chapter 4, beginning at verse 32. So if you have your Bibles, you can make reference to that. But let me just say that that early church was a biblical church. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They believed the Bible, they lived the Bible, they promoted the Bible. They were a praying church. I don't believe that any church that God is going to use mightily can avoid the place of prayer. Prayer is the key. Somebody said it this way, when we work, we work, but when we pray, God works. They were a praying church. They were a fellowshipping church. They were devoted not only to the apostles' teaching, but also to one another. They really did believe that they were the body of Christ and that every member of that body had something to contribute and something that was important to the whole. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 44, they were all together in one place, not just physically, but also emotionally and socially and spiritually. It says that this way in Acts chapter 4, verse 32, they were of one heart and one mind. They had found the secret of having unity in the midst of a diversity. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, Paul says it this way, Be like-minded, or one translation uh, translates those words, Live in harmony with one another. It's kind of like a, an orchestra. There's many different instruments in a good orchestra, but they play together in harmony. And that's the way it should be in the church of Jesus, the body of Christ. Philippians chapter 2, Paul says it this way, having the same love, being of one spirit and one purpose. God will bless the church that is pulling together and that is all pulling in the same direction, God's direction. And then it says in Philippians chapter 2 that we should serve one another with humility. Wow, what a church that would be if we could just live according to all the biblical principles. In Psalm 133, the psalmist says, How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell, to dwell together in unity. For there God commands his blessing. This love that they had in the early church wasn't just theoretical. It wasn't just emotional. It was practical. They talked about love and unity, but they also demonstrated it in their daily lives. Sometimes it's one thing to talk about loving one another, but it's another thing to do it. Somebody said, to live above with the saints we love. Now that will be grace and glory, but to live below with the saints we know. Now that's a different story. Uh, I heard a story once about a child psychologist who didn't have any children of his own, but he lived on a street that had a lot of children. And uh, every once in a while, he, you'd hear him hollering out of his uh, front porch, you parents should treat your children better. And don't now Be nice to them. Don't correct them. Don't holler at them. Don't shout at them. But one day, he had a cement driveway poured to his home. And uh, when he looked out to his horror, there were the kids putting their handprints into his brand new driveway. And he shouted out, you kids, get off there. Get out of that driveway. And the parents that had heard him shouting to them said, uh, but I, we understand you're not supposed to shout at children like that. He said, well, I love them in the abstract. I just don't love them in the concrete. Well, sometimes it's a little bit like that in our love. Uh, we can talk about it, but it's harder to live out in daily life. And one of the expressions of their love is recorded for us in Acts chapter 2, verse 44. It says, they had all things in common. I want to expand that just for a moment to unpack that, having everything in common. We'll notice that their attitude in this is given in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, where it says, they did this with glad and sincere hearts. For them it was pure joy. 
For them, it wasn't difficult. It was an expression of their appreciation and affection for one another. The New English Bible says they did it with unaffected joy. They were praising God the whole time, it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. Now, let me just comment on this having all things in common. Because some have suggested this almost sounds like a form of communism. Well, in communism, everybody is equal. It's just that some people are a little bit more equal, or quite a bit more equal than others. But when we associate communism with, with a type of government, we often think of it the fact that there's, it's an authoritarian style of government. It's a dictatorial style of, of leadership. But uh, Acts chapter 2 was not communism. You say, well, maybe it was socialism, where they had everything in common. Well, no, they did it of their own will. They did it volitionary, volitionally. There was nothing that compelled them, as we read in the story of Ananias and Sapphira. It said, when the land was yours, wasn't it your possession? And when you sold it, wasn't the money still yours? Like, you didn't have to give it. So this was not a situation where the church or some society owned everything. Actually, the money and the, mo and the land still belonged to the people. But this was their attitude. It belongs to me, but if you need it, you are more than willing to use it. If you have a need that I can fill, then I'd be happy to help you with that. Now, in order for this system to work, there has to be a high level of trust. We have to trust that somebody's not going to take advantage of the system. This isn't a, a welfare system where people can just be idle and, and live off, the, off of other people. Even though we know that there will be times when our generosity will be taken advantage of, doesn't mean that we shouldn't be willing to share with others. It would be better to make an error in the area of grace than an error in the area of being stingy. So Paul taught, however, in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, if somebody doesn't work, then they shouldn't eat. Now that sounds fairly severe, pretty strong language, but actually what he is saying is that if somebody is not willing to work, or another translation says if somebody refuses to work, it's not talking about those people who unfortunately have not been able to get employment. It's talking about people who willingly have the opportunity, but don't take advantage of it. Paul is saying we, we mustn't excuse idleness. There is a difference between those who can't work and those who won't work. And in order for this system to work where we share all things together, there not only has to be an element of trust, there also has to be a, a loose grip on our possessions. We have to realize that we are stewards of what we have. We are not really the ultimate owners. The Bible says in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And we have to take that attitude that everything we have is also the Lord's and he can do with it as he chooses. But the Bible is very clear that we do have a responsibility to care for the poor and the needy. Many times the Bible says that we should care for the fatherless, the orphans, and the widows. If you want reference to that, read in Isaiah chapter 58, where it says this is the fast that the Lord has chosen, that we help those people who have needs. Jim Cantillon, who for many years has worked with AIDS victims in the continent of Africa, said this, God finds Christians who care for the poor irresistible. God has a soft spot in his heart for those who are needy, and he desires that we do the same. Now, over the years, maybe our wardrobes have gotten a little larger, our cars have gotten a little fancier, our homes a little bit more elaborate, and our church is more impressive. But uh, let's not forget the source of our wealth. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, Deuteronomy 8, 18, it says, Remember the Lord your God, 
for he is the one who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Let's not forget that in the ministry of Jesus, he had a very soft spot in his heart for the people who were needy. If you read in Luke chapter 4 where he quotes from Isaiah, you see, he says, I have been called to minister to the poor and to minister to the prisoner and to those who are oppressed. So we need to keep our hearts open to love and to unity and to generosity. When everybody gave as they could, everybody received as they had need. And it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 34, there was not a needy person among them, but they were all filled with joy and great miracles were performed. In Acts chapter 4, verse 33, it says, they had great power and great grace, and many were saved. Acts chapter 2, verse 47, and the Lord added daily to the church those that should be saved. Daily, if my mathematics is correct, I think that means that there would be at least 365 every year added to the body of Christ. Well, it sounds pretty exciting, but it wasn't all good, unfortunately. The first word in chapter 5 is but. Somebody said this is a negative but. This is a contrasting but. It was a great church, but it wasn't a perfect church. And uh, part of the problem was there were people in that church. And as long as there are people, the church will not be perfect because, friends, we're not perfect yet. Now, I know some of you are getting very close. In fact, I think only you and me are probably about perfect. And, and sometimes I even wonder a little bit about you. You know, the, the people who think they're perfect really upset those of us who already are. Well, I like that expression, no, we're not perfect, just forgiven. Remember Acts chapter 2, verse 46, where it says, they served the Lord with glad and sincere hearts. Well, not everybody in the early church fit that category. Everybody didn't serve with a sincere heart. There were bad apples in that church. Well, at least two bad apples that we know about, and we read about them in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. I wonder if you've ever had the occasion where everything was going well, and then all of a sudden something arose that just uh, kind of threw a monkey wrench into the whole thing. It was like the fly in the ointment. Ephesians chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 1 says, As a dead fly gives perfume a bad smell, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A fly in the ointment. I remember once Pat and I were going to California to visit her family. We were on a two-week vacation, and uh, we crossed the border. We were just about Seattle, and it dawned on me, that I was supposed to leave a house key with someone to take care of our house while we were gone. And there was the key, house key, on my key set, key chain. Well, maybe you've had an experience like that where you thought everything was cared for, but then just something didn't quite get attention that it should have. Uh, I think of Esther in the Old Testament. Uh, queen Esther was chosen by the king to be the queen, and uh, there was a, a gentleman, I'll call him a gentleman, in that Persian culture, whose desire was to eradicate the Jewish people. His name was Haman. And uh, when Esther became aware of the fact that he wanted to annihilate her nation because she was Jewish, she invited him to a dinner. Well, he was so pleased. Uh, and then she invited him back for a second private dinner with her and the king. And Haman, thinks, this is tremendous. I am really getting close to the king. But he says this in Esther chapter 3, verse 15, uh, 13. But this, this gives, all of this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. You see, all of the people bowed down to Haman except Mordecai. <laughs> 
And Mordecai refused to bow down and give him honor because Mordecai was a worshiper of the true God. And so as far as Haman was concerned, Mordecai was the fly in the ointment. Didn't matter what else he had, didn't matter what else happened, as long as there was Mordecai, he could not be happy. But the truth is, Haman himself was actually the fly in God's ointment. And God used Esther in a wonderful way to save the nation of Israel. It's an exciting story in the Old Testament. But uh, there were two flies in the ointment of the New Testament church. One was named Ananias, and the other was named Sapphira. They were husband and wife. Now, Ananias actually means Jehovah is gracious. And Sapphira actually means beautiful, the same root that we get the word sapphire from. But in both cases, they did not live up to their names. Up until this time, the church had received persecution, but it had always come from outside of the church. And now there is a problem inside of the church. Friends, the church will never be destroyed by an outside force. The thing that will bring destruction and corruption to the church is that which happens on the inside. And what we find in Acts chapter 5 is that there actually were hypocrites in the first century church. Can you believe it? Hypocrites in the church. It almost sounds like a misnomer. How could that be? Because, well, we know that we're not perfect, and the world sometimes is very quick to point out our imperfections and to point out our inconsistencies and they refer to it as hypocrisy. I think part of the problem is that the world has, and it's maybe not really a problem, but the church has a very high expectation of people who claim to be followers of Jesus. One summer I was the caretaker and the director of the Fraser Valley Camp. It was kind of a mistake, <laughs> but uh, a lady uh, came into the campground one day and said, are, are, are you a Christian? And I said, uh, yes, I, I believe I am. And she said, well, there is a family of wild cats up the road there, and if you're a Christian, you should be taking care of them. And I said, well, uh, would you be interested in taking care of them? No, she said, I'm not a Christian, so it's not my responsibility, but you're a Christian, you should take care of those cats. Well, I went up the road, and sure enough, there was a mother cat and about four or five kittens, and uh, I thought I would do my bird trick. I brought a bo box with me and set it up on a stick with a string attached, and I put some bait under the box, and sure enough, those hungry little kittens, they crawled in there, and I gave a jerk on the string, and sure enough, I caught a couple of them in the box. Now the trick is, how do I get them out of the box and into the bag so I can carry them back to the camp and take care of them? Well, I put my hand under the box, and they pounced on my hands, and I threw my hand up, the box went flying, and... Uh, I tried it again. The second time I didn't catch anything and I said, well, I, I'm afraid I, I'm not going to be able to catch those cats. They are indeed wild. But it's interesting that this lady somehow thought that it was my responsibility. It wasn't hers, but because I claimed to be a follower of Jesus, I had this responsibility. They hold this high expectation sometimes of Christians, like we, we're supposed to be perfect and we know we're not. Mark Twain once said he would never join an organization that would let him in because he knew his own imperfections. But uh, maybe another problem in the church is that sometimes we pretend to be what we're really not. And the Greek word for hypocrisy is to wear a mask. We pretend that we're one thing on the outside, but really we're something different on the inside. And that was a problem with Ananias and Sapphira. Their action looked good on the outside, but there was deceit and deception in their hearts. Now you might ask yourself, like, well, why would they lie about selling the land and giving the money to the apostles to distribute to the needy? Well, I think one of the problems was greed. Uh, Peter says, why have you held back a part? We don't know how big a part he held back. But it really doesn't matter because the sin wasn't really the holding back the money. The real sin was the lying, the deceit part. 
but he probably held back enough to help himself and take care of his own needs. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. He could have been honest about it, but that greed may have gotten a little bit of a hold of his heart. Another problem was that uh, he didn't want to be humbled. He wanted to receive praise for what he had done. You see, in Acts chapter 5, we have to kind of go back to the last few verses of chapter 4 to get the background. And the last few verses of chapter 4 tell us that there was a man by the name of Barnabas who sold land and he gave it all to the apostles. Now, this is the first time in the Bible that we meet Barnabas. He's one of my favorite biblical characters. We're going to meet him again later in Acts chapter 11 and in the ministry of the Apostle Paul. But he was a humble man, and he was a gracious man, and obviously he was a generous man. Now, I, I don't know, but I'm kind of taking from this story that the people probably applauded uh, Barnabas, which means, by the way, son of encouragement, for doing this, for selling his property and giving the money. And, and Ananias and Sapphira thought, did you see that? Did you see how the people praised him for doing that? We would like to receive that same kind of accolation. We would like to see that receive that same kind of praise, but they weren't prepared to pay the price. And so uh, Peter says to Ananias, why have you allowed Satan to fill your heart and to put this deceit in your heart? Well, we know that Satan is the ultimate source of all temptation, but we can't blame the devil for everything. Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. Well, uh, no, the Bible says that we are actually led astray sometimes by our own desires and by our own lust. Uh, James says in his book in the Bible, if we will submit to God and resist the devil, then the devil is compelled to flee from us. The devil may be the source of temptation, but ultimately we are responsible for our actions and our behavior. And Ananias and Sapphira, they were responsible for their sin. They didn't have to sell the land. But it says in verse 3, you have lied not to men, but you have lied to uh, the Holy Spirit. In verse 3, and in verse 4, the next verse it says, you have not lied to men, but you have lied to God. Here's one biblical evidence that the Holy Spirit is God. He is divine. In one verse it says you've lied to the Holy Spirit. In the next verse you have lied to God because the Holy Spirit is uh, the third person of the Godhead. And then we also see in this that the Holy Spirit is a person. You don't lie to a fence post. You don't lie to a telephone post. You lie to somebody that can respond. The Holy Spirit is a person. He has a personality. And notice that their sin was against God. David in Psalm 51, which is the great penitent Psalm of David, says, Against you, God, against you alone I have sinned, and I have done what was wrong or evil in your sight. Friend, Sin is a travesty against society because it brings moral pollution into our culture. Sin is a crime against others because it causes hurt and shame. And it's a disappointment to ourselves. But ultimately, sin is an insult and an offense against God. It hurts the church. And in this case, it was premeditated. It was planned. It was deliberate and defiant. It wasn't just a momentary lapse. It wasn't just a sudden impulse that they had. They had planned this offense against God. Now you might ask yourself, how did Peter know that they had done this? Well, a naturalist would say, well, he must have seen something in Ananias' face that caused him to think that he's not telling the truth. And that's why Peter was able to identify the fact that they were lying. But uh, there has to be a supernatural element in this. Because later, when his wife, when the wife Sapphira comes into the, like I said, the second service three hours later, uh, Peter says to her, uh, not only have you lied, 
but you are also going to die just like your husband. Now, Peter did not have the gift of killing people. He had the gift that's called in, the, in Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians 12, the gift of the word of knowledge. God had told Peter what was really the truth. And so Peter understands their situation because God has revealed it to him. Um, the punishment in this case was sudden and severe. They die on the spot. It's instant death. It's the first record of a church funeral. It was pretty simple and pretty quick. In verse 5 it says, Ananias expired. In other words, he breathed out his last breath. He breathed out his life. Some would say that this uh, death was the result of a heart attack. When, when Peter identified his sin, the shock was so great that his heart stopped. But as I said with uh, Sapphira, it was more than just a heart attack. It was God. This was God's intervention. And, and we might ask ourselves, like, why would God be so severe in a, in a situation like this? Well, first of all, we need to know that sin does bring God's displeasure and that God is not happy with deceit or with hypocrisy. Some people, well, why is God so hard on lying? It says in Revelation chapter 21, all liars will take their place in the fire of punishment. Well, because first of all, God is truth and it is so contrary to his nature. But another problem is that lying is usually associated with some other sin as well. We're trying to cover up. We're trying to somehow not be honest and truthful and transparent. And God is very much against the sin of lying. But this uh, punishment, I believe, was severe because it was the beginning of a new era. It was the beginning of a new age. And whenever God started something new, he usually had some kind of a special indication. For example, when Solomon built the temple in the Old Testament, it says that the glory of the Lord filled the temple so much for three days that they were not able to go in and minister. That was unusual, but it was kind of God's signature that this was his present, his place of residence. And then in the New Testament, we just read a couple weeks ago from Acts chapter 2, that on the day of Pentecost, they saw fire, flame, tongues of fire come down and they heard this mighty wind rushing through the house. That has never, never happened again, at least was never recorded again in the book of Acts. Well, somebody said, now, okay, well, what about tongues? Because they had tongues on the Pentecost too. But there was a difference because in Acts chapter 10, they spoke in tongues again. In Acts chapter 19, they did speak in tongues again. So there's no biblical indication that that was a one-time event. But I believe that here at the beginning of the age of grace, in the era of the Holy Spirit, God wanted to indicate to the church that sin is still sin. I know God is gracious, but that is not an excuse for us to go on sinning. You see, when we sin intentionally against the grace of God, that is actually a disgrace. And, and right at the beginning of the era of grace, the time of the Holy Spirit's presence in the church, I believe that God wanted to establish the fact that even though he is loving, even though he is kind, even though he is forgiving, we still need to understand that sin will ultimately bring the judgment of God. Well, the result of that, it says in our text, was great fear. In verse 5, it says, and great fear came on the people. In verse 11, the people were greatly afraid. This is the third time we see this word great in the book of Acts. The first time is in chapter 4 where it says they had great power. And in the same verse, Acts 4.33, it says they, they had great grace. But here's the third occasion of great in the, in the book of Acts. There was great fear. It means they held God in great reverence. They were filled with awe at the presence of God. In Acts chapter 8, verse 8, it says they had great joy. And in Acts chapter 11, verse 21, it says they had great numbers that were added 
to the church. Well, this incident that we have read about in Acts chapter 5 was a test of integrity for two members of the early church. They failed the test. It was also a test of obedience for Peter and the church itself. What were they going to do about this sin that had crept into the church? How were they going to handle it? And they handled it very directly and very decisively. And the outcome of that, it says in Acts chapter 5, was this spiritual perception led to great spiritual purity and that led to great spiritual power. Can I just say that again? Spiritual perception led to spiritual purity in the church and that led to great spiritual power. May the Lord help us to know the mind of the Spirit and to hear the voice of God and then to respond in obedience to that. God is coming back for a church that is pure, sinless and without wrinkle. Now we know that all of us fall short in different areas of our life. But when we do fail God, then we need to come back to him immediately in repentance and ask for his forgiveness that we might walk in purity. And when the church walks in purity, I believe the church will also walk in power. The result that we read in Acts chapter 5, verses 12 to 16, is that the apostles performed many miracles, and there were many salvations, and there were many healings. The church started off very positive, had a little bit of a dip, a little bit of a hiccup, a little bit of a setback, but because they dealt with it correctly and they, they didn't avoid the issue, they didn't sweep it under the rug, God blessed that church and they multiplied greatly, not only in number, but also in influence. And I believe that there's a lesson in that for us today. If we will walk in purity before God, then he will bless us and we will see his blessing on our church. So the Lord bless you. Thank you so much for being with us. And I hope you can join us again next week when we talk a little bit about the, the leadership of the church. What is God looking for in those who would give spiritual oversight? Thank you so much for, again for being with us. And the Lord bless you. And I hope we can see you again next Wednesday evening. God bless. Bye for now.